And that was very much who my dad was. He was someone who, he was a police officer at the time, but he um, was at the March on Washington. He was very big on giving back to the community. He was born and raised in DC, very much like a Washingtonian, all about like black people in the community. And I was like, I, I missed that piece of me. And I think I had been silencing myself. I had been advocating a little bit here and there, and I had been trying to be a little bit more vocal about who I am here and there. But at that point, like in the height of the pandemic, I was like, you know what, y'all are about to get all of this blackness and you're going to like it or not. And I, I can't help it. Right. Because people are dying and I'm tired of it and we can't change anything if we're quiet. So I, I started making trouble. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 67. Hi everyone, Omari Richens here. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Before anything, make sure that you subscribe, make sure that you like this video, leave a review. Five star reviews go a long way to get the show out to more public health people and help them to navigate their career better. So I greatly appreciate that. If you want to support, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash the PH millennial and support there. And I don't think I've said it in a while, but you can find me on Instagram at the PH Millennial and follow me there as well. Um, I really enjoyed this episode and, and this person's journey in public health. I think she's really trying to trailblaze and she really advocates for herself in a lot of spaces and has forced her way into the positions that, that she has right now and the work that she's doing. And I look forward to all the great things that she is going to do. And I hope that you do too. So be sure to connect with her and support her in, in whatever way that you feel comfortable with. Um, and without further ado, here's today's episode. Enjoy. Today we have a public health professional with over 10 years of experience focused on promoting health equity. She got a Bachelor's of Arts in Human Biology and Africana Studies at Brown University and got a Master's of Public Health from the University of Minnesota. She's an active board member for Rebuilding Together DC Alexandria and works as a health equity enterprise manager at Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield, in addition to being a consultant for her company, Health Equity Jazz. You can follow on Instagram at Health Equity Jazz. We have Jasmine Leonard, MPH. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure. You were recommended by a very good and uh, highly esteemed public health consultant and friend of mine. So I'm glad to have you on the show today. <laughs> yeah, the power of LinkedIn, it's getting us everywhere, right? Yeah, like LinkedIn is amazing. People need to stop sleeping on LinkedIn. That, that is for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how, how are you? How are you doing? How have you been coping during the uh, pandemic? Um, it has been an ordeal, um, but I think that it has been, you know, with the good and the bad, um, the good has been that I have been able to excel professionally. Um, so I get to do things like this now, and I have had a couple of promotions. Um, and so for that, I think the time to sit still has been beneficial to really reorient myself and figure out what I want to do. Um, but then, you know, it, it's hard living through multiple pandemics, right? Because we're not only dealing with the pandemic of COVID, but we're dealing with the pandemic of racism and people are really starting to like awaken to this being an issue. So um, it, it takes an emotional toll. I would be remiss to not say that and to acknowledge that a lot of people are, you know, we're struggling and there seems to be light at the end of the tunnel, but we're still we're still not there yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, I'm glad that you got a couple promotions. It sounded like during the pandemic, which is pretty awesome. And and it sounds like you've also started this platform, Health Equity Jazz, and your consulting business and all of that. And we'll get into all of that later on in in the show also. And I'll be remiss if I didn't ask you to see what your what your T-shirt says. I exist because my ancestors used their creativity to survive. 
That is awesome. That is awesome. And and that is that is big facts, big facts and big energy that I like to see. So uh, I'm, I'm yes, I, absolutely. Yeah, so tell, tell and, me to, yeah, talk about it. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna say, um, I like to I've been very conscious about where I'm spending my money these days. So this is actually from a black woman on business, no definition. Um, so K-N-O-W definition. And um, she has a lot of amazing teas like this one. Um, so I highly recommend if you like to throw your energy out there and to be unapologetically black. Yeah, absolutely. As, as we should be. Um, and t- t- tell me what, what made this shift for you to be more intentional in buying like just black or I guess BIPOC people's clothing and products and services, et cetera. Yeah, so I honestly you know it's sad when you like go back into your bank account and start to look at like all of the things that you purchased and you're just like oh that's why I don't have money in my account right now um but like as I was doing that I was you know at the height of 2020 it was like we were waiting for those big names to come out and like put their performative like Instagram post or story to say that they support black lives and all these things and Um, You know, one of the largest companies that I was putting an undisclosed amount of money into um, was Starbucks. And I was, I was waiting, I was waiting, and then they came out. But then like, you find out later that they were telling their employees, oh, like, you can't wear any Black Lives Matter paraphernalia. Um, Like, we don't want to be on record with that in the store. We don't want people to feel uncomfortable. And I was like, I, what? I should have stock in your company as much as I spend. Like, um, and so at that point I was like, you know what, I'm just going to be more conscious about where I'm putting my money and my energy. Um, and so it's been nice to find like new companies and to support small businesses. Um, you know, consulting is essentially a small business for me right now. So I'm like, if you're going to buy into me, I should buy into you and buy into our community. Right. We have, an amazing amount of buying power and if we put it back into our community things would shift so absolutely absolutely i want to say it's like in in the uh in the trillions i think like black americans it's, it's in the trillions of dollars and it's, it's interesting because if you look at other communities they circulate their dollar within their community a lot longer than the black yes. community which which is uh fascinating and i guess that could be a whole different conversation and a topic in, in itself um <laughs> absolutely uh so, so tell me how, how do you identify and then tell us a little bit about your personal background yeah so pronouns are she her um i consider myself to be black american i know there's a lot of controversy on whether you say you're african-american or whatever the case may be i i like to just say i'm black i you know have been generationally here for a while and I can't pinpoint to a country in Africa to say like that's where I'm from so I don't feel comfortable saying I'm African-American honestly. My parents were from and lived in this area so I'm out in gorgeous Prince George's County, Maryland Um, and so lived here most of my life except for times in school and it's it's home. Um, My family is here, kind of like my immediate family is here. Um, And it's really like in in me. Um, I'm proud to say that I'm from this area that, you know, goes back and forth as being like the richest area for Black people in America. I think, you know, I still, I think we're number one right now. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's like always between Prince George's County and Atlanta. So um, we'll go with where we're number one right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. It's it's on record. It's on record. And and, and uh, thank you for sharing uh, how you see your identity. Like, I also see myself as Black. Um, I was born in the U.S., but didn't grow up here. I grew up in the Caribbean and then in the Middle East for a bit. Um, and I definitely do. There's a lot of identity things there, but I, I definitely resonate with that Blackness because same with me, I I don't know where my ancestors are from. They they were parts of the slave trade at some point in, in time and in life and whatnot. So I, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you identify as Black. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's beautiful, right? <laughs> it is, it is, it is. So t- tell me before we get into your story, what does uh, public health mean to you? So I've been thinking about this a, a little bit, right? And I had like a very, like, I guess, real definition for it and I was like I don't know if that's what it means to me honestly 
So I'll say that it to me is like the back door of all of like medicine, healthcare, and everything that we see. I feel like when we look at the healthcare landscape, we're always thinking of doctors, nurses, and um, now I guess we're thinking about scientists because of COVID and the pandemic and everything. But uh, for me, public health is kind of what you're not seeing. It's the people that are advocating in the background, the people that have been invested in the community and want to stay in the community. And, you know, for that reason, it's amazing because you can have so many different professions that are building into this community and making it what it is. I, I don't think, I think it's like that, that good, like melting pot of just everything that is all about your health and well-being from you know your head down to your toes um mind body and soul so that's what it means to me yeah absolutely i like that and yeah i definitely think it is a backbone and a very underappreciated backbone i probably say this a lot on this podcast people probably get tired of me me saying that but yeah <laughs> uh, it is it is the facts um so you got your bachelor's of arts in human biology and africana studies at brown university so what was the thought process for going to get this degree yeah so i honestly i'll say it now brown was not my first choice um when i was applying to school as a high schooler I actually really wanted to go to Goucher College, which is like a small liberal arts school in uh, Towson, Maryland. And I thought that that was where I wanted to go primarily because I didn't want to be too far from home, but then I like wanted to still be able to have a little bit of freedom um, in what I was designing and what I was doing. Um, and, you know, I got into Goucher and I was, ready to go until I also got into Brown. And then you have to make that hard decision, right? Like it's an Ivy and whether you're like kind of elitist when it comes to school, like I am or not, um, you do kind of make, you have to really consider what's going on there. Um, and so when I got into Brown, I actually had applied to also be in their program and liberal medical education. So plea me. Um, and that's like an eight year program that says that you already know you want to be a doctor. So you're admitted as a freshman, essentially with like almost a guaranteed admission into medical school as well. Um, and so I was like, well, you can't turn that down. You can't be a plea student and not go. Um, and then also financially, I to this day cannot understand how it was cheaper for me to go to Brown than to go to University of Maryland. And so, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever goes into those decision making processes for financial aid, um, there were a lot of factors. And at the time, flights were so cheap, like I would get flights to back and forth for like $29. Um, so it made sense. It's only an hour flight. I felt like I was close enough to home that like I could always get home if I needed to. Um, and it, it spoke to me when I went to visit. It was, um, they have like a day on College Hill, which is ADOC, and you essentially get to come and meet other students that were also admitted and see the see classes and meet people and all those things. Um, and then they also had like a day that was for, and I don't know what it's called now, I'll be honest. Uh, like when I was there, it was called third, the third world like transition and third world um, community. So I think that they changed the name because people felt like that was problematic. Um, but essentially you get to meet a lot of like other minority students, which coming in, that was the best thing that I could do because Brown is very white. Providence is very white. And meeting other people of color, I was like, oh, I won't be the only one. Okay, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So t tell me more about the, the thought process for, cause you said you got accepted into Gats, Gatlin, or Goucher. Goucher, sorry. So you got to say this is a Goucher and you're in Brown <laughs> and you have to decide between those two. So what was the thought process be between like deciding Brown? Was it just because it was an Ivy League or how, how did that come about? So it, it was after I visited, I, I honestly sat down with my mom um, and I'll, like, I'll be honest, the reason I wanted to stay home was because my dad had just recently passed away and I wasn't sure like how... Like, I didn't want to be away from my mom, right? I'm an only child, so that's part of me. Like, I was like, the only other person in my life is, like, here. And if I go to Providence, Rhode Island, what does that mean, right? 
Um, but when I sat down and looked at kind of what am I choosing Goucher because this is like the school that's meant for me or am I choosing it because it's comfortable? Um, and, you know, I had to really weigh that out. Um, and Brown, even though as white as it was or is, um, it just felt like I belong there, right? I, I think I'm a hippie at heart and Brown is very much hippie energy. Um, it Like of the Ivies, like we all are hippies. Like look at the alumni profile, like the V Diggs, Tracy Ellis Ross, like hippies, right? Like, um, so that part of it felt good to me. And then I'll be honest, at the time I wanted to be a doctor. And so to be able to kind of say, well, I almost have a guaranteed admission in a medical school. I won't have to take the MCATs. I won't have to like do all these other things that kids are going to have to do. I was like, well, that feels like a no brainer. Okay. That, that's crazy. I didn't know that you, you would be able to not take the MCATs, but I guess it makes sense if you're just going to get funneled into their program. Yep. Okay, that's that's very fascinating. I did not know that at all. Um, I tried to get into the Masters of Medical Sciences program before I went into med school. Didn't get accepted. Uh, got interviews, <laughs> but but I I've been to Brown a couple of times because I have family out in Rhode Island, so it, it's a really gorgeous school. That that is for sure. Um, so tell me, so <laughs> you you were in this plea plea me is that what we call it plea me? Yep, plea me. So what? Why did you not go on to, to, to medicine or is that later on in your, in your story? No, I mean, we can, we can talk about it now. So mm -hmm. um, when I was in the process of graduating, they sit you down and they have a conversation and say, you know, what are your thoughts in going into medical school? What are your concerns? And a very real concern was for me, how am I going to pay for this? This, you know, medical school is not cheap. Um, loans are not fun. And, you know, what does that mean? Um, I actually started, I, I was in medical school, right? So I, I tend to not really like put it out there because I did not finish. Um, and it honestly was one of the hardest experiences I've had, not because of the academics, but because of like everything else that was going on in my life. Um, my mom started to have a lot of complications um, from being a long-term diabetic. And so she was essentially going through kidney failure when I started. And at that point, it was very clear to me that I did not have the support of the staff there. Um, and I had, I felt like even from my initial conversation with the advisor at that point that they were basically trying to get me to leave. So they made it as hard as possible for me in terms of, you know, I'm going through all these emotional things. I probably should have been given the opportunity to take a leave of absence. Um, and I, I wasn't given all of the opportunities that I, I hope that they're better at doing now. Um, and Honestly, it was the best decision for me. I, I left. Um, I came back home and I spent, you know, what would I didn't know at the time. It was like the last, you know, year and a half of my mom's life with her. So it it turned out for the best and it gave me time to like have a thought to say, is this what I want to do? Like, I'll be honest that I was appalled in some of my classes because there, they, there's a class called doctoring. And it's essentially a class that's designed to teach you how to be empathetic. And I felt like, wait, what? Like you have to teach this to someone that wants to be a doctor. Like you have to teach people how not to be a jerk when they're giving a, like a medical exam. You have to teach people how not to be racist. You have to teach people how not to be sexist and homophobic and all of these things. And they've already gotten into medical school and these are our future doctors of America. Wow. Like, so, you know, through that experience, I really like sat down and I was like, okay, is this what I want to do? Like, and even before that, I had thought to myself that I wanted to be a I, I knew I was going to be a, like a poor doctor, right? Because I wasn't going to go into a field that was like, you know, going to be Dr. 90210 on television or anything like that. I was going to be in the community. I was going to come back home and be a doctor. 
And that automatically meant that I wasn't going to be, you know, out of the boat making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and so it just, it gave me time to, to think. Um, I have a lot of friends that completed the program, are amazing doctors now. I have nothing against um, medical school and the profession. It just was not right for me. And if I'm honest with myself, I probably knew that as like a three-year-old because my, par my parents would tell me that when they asked me what I wanted to be, I said, I wanted to be a lawyer first, and then I wanted to be a doctor. And they always asked, well, why do you want to be a lawyer? And it was because I wanted to, um, I wanted to get justice for my dad because he had had like a bad like um, oral surgery that had like messed up his mouth and things. And so I was like, I want to put those bad people away for that. And then I wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to heal people. And so a three-year-old doesn't know about public health. Uh, you know, an 18-year-old me didn't know really about public health. 22-year-old me didn't really know about public health. And it wasn't until I was like 24 that I was applying to a master's in public health that I understood that like I would probably always been going in that direction. I just didn't know how to like phrase it. And I didn't know what the what the field was. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Before anything, um, condolences. I'm really sorry to hear that you have lost both of your parents. Um, that I, I, I don't even know what to say to that, that power to you for pushing on and just continuing to do great things that you're doing. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there before I forgot. But yes, to everything that you said just now, yes, yes, yes. Um, I feel like it's so interesting because a lot of people that do get into medical school are people who get into medical school because they're good at like taking tests. They're just really smart or not, not smart, but they're good at like regurgitating information and just taking in information. Yep. And as you said, it's very interesting that they don't have that empathetic skill, which is something that is needed. And we can see, especially as public health professionals, where that disconnect is between the physician and the patient and they, there's a whole host of other things there. So I, I think that the entire model of medical school need, needs to change, but it's, it's not going to, but <laughs> yeah, I can see what I want to say. Yeah, yeah. I'm all about like disrupting systems and breaking it up. Um, that is definitely a system that needs to be wholeheartedly disrupted and broken. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of money in it. There's a lot of like history in it. And who knows where it's going. Yeah, yeah, I, I have no no idea. Okay, so so after your bachelor's, you you went in well bachelor's into medical school starting. Was it the first year that you you left? Yeah, so it was the time is kind of awkward, right? So I was there, and then um, I ended up I did take the spring semester off, and then. I came back because I was like still technically a student and I was like, you know, we'll, 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 we'll figure this out. I was still wholeheartedly like, I'm gonna be a doctor. Um, and so then I came back and then I left. Um, so, you know, it essentially at that point when I left, I was 24 or 20, yeah, 23 turning 24 essentially. Um, and then I came home and I, stayed at home okay awesome and just to the last point before i forget about because i my mind is always yeah. on so many things um i think it's important <laughs> you said that you didn't you felt like no support from brown and from from all that you were going through and i think that's so important especially in grad school that which can be very stressful it, whether that's bachelor's your, your graduate school medical school whatever i think it's so important to have people around you that are supporting you and and seeing what you're going through and like really giving a helping hand to really be there for you and and give you the resources or help or time or whatever it is to, to make you really succeed and get to that point in time so i think like it honestly um honestly i think it was a good decision if, if you didn't feel that support because medical school is stressful hella, hella yeah. stressful. So, <laughs> so so yeah okay so so i'm guessing you moved back home and you became a visiting student in public health at the university of maryland is that what happened so I, okay, so when I got back home and then, um, you know, after my mom passed, I was still kind of like, oh no, I still want to be a doctor. Like, because I think I had promised myself, right, that I was going to be a doctor. And I felt like, well, you know, 
this was kind of the last thing that I was doing, like, while my mom was alive, like, my dad knew that I wanted to be a doctor, like, I need to do this. And so I decided that I was like, gonna take so the thing about the, the PLEMI program is you don't take all of the requirements for medical school. So if I was going to apply to another medical school, that meant that I had to take the requirements that were kind of missing, um, as well as prepare and study for the MCAT, right? So uh, <laughs> why I thought this was a good idea, I mean, I was still <laughs> young. I, I, like, <laughs> But anyway, I, so I started going to University of Maryland to essentially take some of the requirements that I was missing, as well as to bring up my science GPA, because at Brown, you can take all of your classes pass fail. I did not do that, okay? But for my like higher level science courses that I potentially knew weren't gonna go that great, I was like, well, why not take this pass fail? So I needed to increase my science GPA. And so that's why I started taking classes at University of Maryland, um, just to try and like give me a better application to the um, med school, because that was still the thought. Okay, that that makes that makes sense. But but did did you go in as like a public health student or was was it just like you were taking so, classes? No, okay, so so I went just taking classes. But then when I eventually realized that I was going to be I was actually in my public health program at the time, I went back to University of Maryland and then I took a couple of public health courses so that I could finish a health equity focus for my public health degree. Okay, okay. And Okay, so you said that you didn't know about public health. What, what, what was the thing that made you find out about public health? So when I started working, um, so I had started working in, I don't know, time escapes me. Um, but essentially, at some point, I started working as a medical assistant for um, an affluent pediatric practice in Montgomery County, Maryland. I, again, was still thinking medicine is the thing. So I was like, well, let me also get this experience. I like kids. Um, I really needed a job. I started working in their flu clinic and then I was hired full time to become a medical assistant. And in that I was like, oh, this is, you know, not necessarily what I thought it was. Like these doctors do the same thing every day, all day. It's the same thing. I can diagnose these kids now. Like. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> but I was like, still interested, still, you know, very much invested in health. Um, at the same time, though, they were in the transition from going from like an outdated electronic medical record system to a new one. And something about me is that I am a, a tech geek. I consider myself to be like, quick on it. You know, I always, well, up until like the last few iterations of the iPhone, I've always had like the that one like day of very much into computers and kind of all the data and like stuff like that. And so when they were migrating their EMR system, I got really interested in all the data that goes into EMR systems, right? I was like, these things are fascinating, but a lot of people aren't doing what they could do with them. Um, and so at that point, I was like, well, maybe I should like look into the data health side of things. Um, and so that became uh, looking at informatics. So then when you start looking at informatics programs, you know, you're kind of like limited to ones that are like very, very science heavy. Um, and one that stood out to me, though, was this like public health informatics degree with the University of Minnesota. Um, so... I was like, this looks interesting. Public health, let me Google what that is. Cause again, still don't necessarily know what it is. And so I'm like reading all these things and I'm like, oh, like, okay. Like health equity. And I guess before health equity was a buzzword and um, oh, like immunizations and like understanding that people should be healthy and all these other things that we like don't always think about as public health, but like, this is what it is. And so I was like, this is cool. So um, again, I will say I am an academic elitist. So I looked up the rankings for um, University of Minnesota. And I was like, oh, they're in like the top 20. Like this isn't a bad program. Um, and so I was like, well, let me apply. We'll see what happens. Um, so I got in and then I was like, 
at this point, still working with the um, the pediatrics practice, and um, my degree was in public health informatics. I was like super excited about this, but this was also around this time. I want to say when Freddie Gray um, was murdered in Baltimore. And so the social justice side of me was starting to really like percolate. And I was like, I'm really tired of seeing people that look like me die. Um, and I feel like we should be doing more about this. So Minnesota has a health equity concentration. I think now it's a minor. Um, and so I like, I wanted to do that. The thing about it, I was completing my degree online. The concentration is in person. So I had to advocate for myself to say, no, I want to complete this. Um, let's figure out a way for me to do the work group and to be a part of the like concentration um, course. And I'll figure out the other stuff. And so that meant that I essentially, I before Zoom, right? So I think we were on Skype. Um, <laughs> I would Skype into class, the only person, um, while all of my other uh, cohort cohort members were in person, um, I was taking the like one credit kind of leadership course for that. And then I completed courses um, at University of Maryland that were designed to be health equity, social justice focused. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for that, that story. <laughs> that puts a lot more perspective on it. So the medical assistant position at Pontomac Pediatrics, is, is that, that's the same position you were talking about just now? Yep. Okay, so yep. How, how did you come across this? Good old days of Craigslist, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't recommend doing that now. Um, <laughs> but before Craigslist became like, not the thing that you should do. Um, they used to have jobs on there, right? And so I, I needed a job um, and they had, like I saw a application for a flu clinic um, person. And so I was like, mm, you know, I, I could do that. Like, this seems pretty interesting. Um, and so I applied, they like emailed me, I interviewed and then like, I wanna say very shortly I was hired to be um, at, in their flu clinic. And so in that role, I was essentially managing the flu clinic that they have. And then also like administering the vaccine and, you know, learning some of the ins and outs of the office, but it wasn't a guarantee that I would be hired to become like an actual medical assistant with the practice. So, um, I want to say I was in the flu clinic, um, probably for about four to five months um, before being hired full-time to become part of their um, medical assistant team. Okay, okay. Thank you for sharing that. And then I know you spoke a, a little bit about what you did and then you were shifted or promoted into in-house technology supervisor? Yeah, so that was part of that like EMR migration thing, right? So they, they realized that I was like good at figuring out stuff. And so I was essentially doing that while being a medical assistant. Um, so it, it was a, a nice pay increase, um, but I was still primarily a medical assistant and then just also helping with any of like the data things that came up with the EMR and also just like in-house tech issues because for some reason it didn't seem like they were as adept at like understanding why the printer's not working or why the <laughs> internet is out and things like that. And I didn't mind it. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Important skill sets, important skill sets. Um, and then after this, or during this time, maybe you were a volunteer at the Hotline Crisis Council. You were a Hotline Crisis Counselor volunteer and also a Hotline Crisis Counselor interviewer for Crisis Link. So what is it about? What, what are the differences in being a counselor versus a counselor interviewer? Yeah, so... One of the things about being someone who has experienced grief, um, it's a lot easier to talk to people um, when they're in crisis. And at the time it felt like something that I could do to kind of like help myself through my own issues. Um, and so Crisis Link, um, you know, if you ever dial kind of like a crisis hotline number, they can pick up some of the calls. Um, and I was 
a person that would sit there and answer calls as they came in for people that were in crisis. Um, so it could be that they are someone that's experiencing suicidal ideation or they actually have a plan. Um, it could also be people that were experiencing domestic violence and needed to get you know, resources to be able to get out of that situation. It was also people, veterans that needed housing support, that needed shelter, things like that. They kind of get a lot of different calls um, that come in through that system. And so it was probably one of the best experiences that I've had because you learn how to actively listen. And I don't think a lot of people have that skill. And you also learn to be able to recite what people are saying to you back to, undersure, to ensure that you understand what they're saying and so that they reflect back on what they're saying. Um, and so that experience was amazing. When you're there for a certain period of time, you can also become an interviewer so that you can start to you know, shepherd in the new class of volunteers. And that was kind of what I did. I had been there for a while and I wanted to be able to put my stamp on you know, who's coming in next. And so I transitioned to interview people as they were applying for the um, hotline listener position. Okay, well, thank you for explaining that. And thank you for doing that work. And uh, oh, that was, is it easy to become a volunteer for, for the, hot, the hotline crisis? So it is, I don't wanna say it's easy, right? Like mm -hmm. there, there is an application process, there is an extensive training um, so I think a lot of times you think, oh, this will be something quick. No, you like really have to dedicate time and you actually have to pass to some degree in terms of becoming a listener. Um, so there are a lot of situations that you go through, a lot of the kind of scenarios and things. And then if you go through all of that and you still want to do it, then you can essentially become a listener. Um, I think in total, you end up doing about 60 hours of training and then you get on the phone and then you also have to have supervised calls to have someone be there and kind of listen to what's going on. Um, so it, I, I don't want to say it's easy and it's also not necessarily easy to listen to the, the problems that people are calling with. It can be triggering. Um, and so that's why for a lot of callers, they recommend that you have a therapist or that you are in therapy or that you've like recently graduated from therapy to know that you're safe enough to mentally kind of deal with that. Um, but I think it's a, a rewarding experience. And now I think you can do it like through text message and um, things like that. So it's definitely evolved in the space since I was doing it, but I, a caveat in saying that it's an easy kind of position. Yeah, 60 hours is no joke though, to get training. That's <laughs> no joke. Um, and then after your, your position as a medical assistant slash in-house technical technology supervisor, you decided to go and pursue your MPH at the University of Minnesota. So tell me about the thought process for that. So I actually was completing my master's while I was still working for a little bit. Um, and so because my master's was online, I, I'm this person that like really doesn't like to sit still when I get going. Um, and so I was like, well, I can still work and do my master's program. Like this will be easy. And um, honestly, it wasn't that bad because again, they, that was a truly online design program. So you could do your courses when you needed to, things like that. And I mostly worked like earlier in the day um, from like 7 30 to 3 and so I could just essentially dedicate my evenings um, to that but yeah when I kind of what we talked about like when I was thinking about this idea of oh do I want to do informatics like I'm interested in the data health side of things that was when I really started looking at programs and Honestly, Minnesota was the only public health program that I applied to. The rest were like more masters in data informatics and um, like health informatics. 
but I was excited when I got in because I think that was the right step. It was definitely more aligned with who I am and like who I was becoming at the time. And yeah, it, it worked. Okay. Okay. That's awesome. And I'm glad that you got in. What, what, was, what was your concentration? It sounds like it would be something like biostatistics, but I'm thinking that it's probably not. So it technically, I guess, is like informatics, right? Because they, the, so it's a master in public health. And then I guess my concentration is health informatics because I not only took the public health um, core required courses, but then I had a lot of informatics courses as well. Um, so I, I believe that's what the concentration is. And then I had a health equity focus because I, you know, I can't sit still. So <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And then during during your MPH, you were in a health disparities work group. So t- talk about that for a bit. So when I advocated to complete the health equity focus, that meant that I had to become a part of the work group. And so the work group was kind of that like one credit course that would meet and discuss current issues and current topics within health equity, Um, well, health disparities, because, you know, we're evolving in our language and where we want to put the emphasis on. And so with that, I was, you know, I feel like I was ahead of my time. I was doing it virtually while everyone else was in Minnesota. And I was one of two people of color in the course um, and in that work group. So that was interesting. Um, It's always interesting to be uh, one of few in white spaces. So um, lots of interesting conversations, but the professor, the lead professor, she's amazing. Um, She is a white woman, but she's like one of the good white women that is doing the work and is willing to kind of let people have a seat at the table. So, you know, she advocated for me as well, given that this was prior something that they never even thought of people participating in, in a uh, remote type of way. And so, um, yeah, it it was, it was very interesting. timely because again this was like 2016 when I started that and so I think that was kind of also the start of a lot of things happening with like Philando Castile and um yeah so good good time (laughs) okay that's good and uh, and yeah it is important I feel to have like white allies or just other race allies in, in general to just help in in whatever whatever sense, like sometimes you have to give you space, but I think it's important because some spaces we are not even able to get into or voices aren't heard or listened to and, and having that that other person there to help you and actually try to levitate your voice is, is important. Um so so I definitely definitely like that that the teacher was was advocating for you. Yes. Um sorry, that was my dog. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> All right, I think we're okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I might actually just keep that in there, to be honest. <laughs> um, uh, so, All right, so if people want to know, his name is Jace. He is a 12-year-old Beagle Chihuahua, and he is, yeah, he's he's my friend. He has been there through a lot, um, so now he has made his podcast premiere. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if you want to send me a picture, I'll put, it, I'll put a picture of him in the show notes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> let's, let's, let's do that. Let's do that. And then uh, also during your time in the MBH program, you were a uh, research intern uh, for the health equity and common health action. So t- tell me about that experience. Yes. So interesting thing. At some point when you get into working and doing a master's degree on online um, and you want some experience, if you go to your current job and say, hey, I need to cut my hours, they may not say yes. And so that's what happened. Um, my job at Potomac Pediatrics was not willing to kind of accommodate me doing an internship. And even though it was only a couple of days, um, I decided that this internship was more important than working full time. Um, So I essentially, you know, we we parted on good terms 
And I started this internship with Common Health Action. So Common Health Action is like a health equity boutique firm in DC. They have a lot of work with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and um, a lot of other kind of players in health equity design and health equity education. And it was a really great experience, right? Because this was the first time I want to say that I was hearing health equity spoken in like those terms. But I feel like as Black people that are invested in health, like we have been thinking about health equity probably all of our lives and just didn't know like what the terminology was. And um, in this internship, I was able to help them with evaluating some of the trainings that they do, as well as look at kind of the behind the scenes in terms of how they created the trainings, what were some of the thought processes and like all of the different modules. And um, I also got to be a part of some of the trainings that they gave. So they do in person and I believe online now, um, trainings for companies, individuals, anyone who's really interested in learning health equity and how to be a better, equitable, diverse, inclusive kind of company or person. And it was really interesting. Um, I think that was outside of college, the first time I had seen adults doing that kind of, ex um, what is it like the privilege walk where essentially you start off at the same point and then go forward or backward depending on your experiences and it was very interesting to see adults do that because I think I did it in college and I think you, you have a very different perspective in college you're probably also a little bit more open um, because you're like well it's college it is what it is um, <laughs> so to see adults get uncomfortable about things like that and then to also for especially the people that were not of color to really this be the first time that they understand that they have really been given so many privileges in life without really earning them. Um, it was a powerful experience, definitely um, a great decision on my end to lean into that health equity space and to, you know, part ways um, with my previous employer just to invest in myself at that point yeah absolutely and like now you're you have your, your business has like with your jobs which is awesome so like, i feel like yes. it, it all it all works out in, in in the end so so i'm glad i'm glad about that um did you have any other takeaways from your mph program that you wanted to share with us so the thing about i think any time when you're in school i would say to be as open and honest about when you need support as possible so the thing about completing um, my master's online was that I was removed from all of my advisors and people and it they the clues that I, I would have hoped maybe somebody could have clued into, I wasn't there personally to say like, I'm struggling with this or I, I need a break for this. Um, but one thing that I promised myself when I started my master's was that I would be open about being someone who lives with depression and anxiety and grief. And so that means that at some points in the year, it's a little bit harder for me to function than in others. And I need some of those accommodations just to like get myself through that period. And for you to not like hold me accountable and, you know, give me an F or whatever for not attending class that day. And so I started to really learn how to advocate for myself, which I did not know how to do in college. And I think the earlier you can learn to do that, the better, especially in academics, because they're not going to want to do that for you, but it's your right to ask for it. And they actually have to do it. Like at that point, when you disclose, like they have to be accommodating for you and they have to give understanding about whatever it may be. Um, and so I know that's not necessarily like, oh, you should take this class or do that. Like, but I think it's a great way to learn to advocate for yourself because you're going to need that when you get into the workplace as well. Um, so if you can start to mimic that behavior when you're in school and it feels a little bit more safe, um, in terms of the environment and things like that, it, it's just a good quality to have. 
Okay, great, great advice. I appreciate that. And yeah, you definitely do have to advocate yourself, advocate for yourself, whether that's in school, or just in, in all situations generally. And yeah. in public, I have to advocate for the people who don't have voices as well. So, so definitely very important. And then you graduated and became a senior research analyst at NORC at the University of Chicago. NORC is actually one of the uh, the companies that I applied to extensively after for, for my MPH after my MPH program. I never heard back from them. <laughs> but, 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 uh, <laughs> tell, tell, tell me how uh, how did you get this position and then what what did you do in it? Um, so I guess my other tip for school is to um, keep keep your friends right. So actually what happened was, is that one of my friends from Brown, she uh, originally is from Connecticut, but when I was still deciding that I was gonna be a doctor or something in those veins, um, she moved down to Bethesda and was working at, and so it's funny you call it Nork because if you work there, they hate that you, like anyone calls it that because they're like, it's no, it's N-O-R-C. Um, <laughs> That's probably why they didn't, they didn't contact me. <laughs> <laughs> no, everyone does it. And um, now that I don't work there anymore, I, I'm like, yeah, Nork, um, it is what it is. But <laughs> um, so she had been working there for, I want to say like maybe a year and a half before I was finishing up my master's program and looking for jobs. And so I reconnected with her and I was like, you know, what, what, what does NYC do? Like, what, what, what's going on? And so, you know, somewhere hidden, um, they actually have an informatics department and it just so happened I was graduating with an informatics degree, right? Kismet. So I asked her, I was like, well, should I apply for the public health side or should I apply for the informatics side? And she was like, well, you know, probably the informatics side because that's a smaller department. It's probably easier to get you in. Um, let me send an email and, um, you know, we'll get you at least through the interview process. So it helps to know people. Um, I applied, I interviewed, I will say that they have a really long interview process. I hope that it has changed because it literally was all day. Um, and I just think that that's a, like, why? Um, <laughs> no one wants to be interviewed from like nine to three. It, it's draining. And so, but, you know, it was a good opportunity to kind of learn from the different experiences that people have. They, the one thing that I do appreciate is that they do a 360 interview. So you not only interview with people that would be your supervisors, but you interview with people that are um, in a role below yours and then like on par. I highly feel like all companies should be doing this. Um, so that is one great thing that they do. Just the length of the interview was too long. Um, but yeah, so did that and basically like as I was graduating, I was starting at NORC. Okay, okay. And, and then what, what kind of work do you do as a senior research analyst? So I was in the informatics department. It can vary across the company, but in my role, I was doing a lot of proposal writing. So if you have never been in a company that does proposals, it is stressful. Um, and so especially in informatics, because it's smaller, they are literally going for every single proposal, everything that they can, and they're quick turnaround. Um, so for me, I was very good at writing uh, the backgrounds and the statements and things like that, just because I was still, and still am, very like detail oriented and I can write a lit review very quickly and kind of distill information down. And so I was writing a lot of proposals as well as helping on different contracts. So, um, and there are a lot of companies like NORC, I think Deloitte works the same as well as um, like, I can't think of some of the other names. That's absolutely I don't know. Oh, like Mathematica and like mm -hmm. those like places, they all kind of operate the same, that they have these contracts from government, um, government agencies or people that need some type of evaluation or technical assistance. And then you essentially become kind of like the background people to help the government agency accomplish what they need to. So 
I was providing technical assistance for some of those grant programs. And the interesting thing, so because when I came in, I was very honest, again, you know, tips of the trade, be honest about who you are. I was starting at that point to be a little bit more honest about who I am and what I wanted. And so I said, yes, I have this informatics degree, but I also see informatics as a proxy to improving health equity. So I wanna also have some participation in public health if possible. And so with that, I also got on public health projects and they have some very large projects with the Office of Minority Health, as well as like the Office of Women's Health. And I was able to help in the evaluation and providing technical assistance for some of the programs that are under the Office of Minority Health. One that was very, very special to me was in looking at adverse childhood experiences and evaluating programs that are all designed at, um, you know, improving kind of the resiliency of children that have ACEs. And that honestly, like when I ended up leaving, that was like the saddest situation because that project meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And I had been able to kind of win over some, like one of the, the government um, workers that we, interacted with the most she loved me um didn't love the rest of the team so uh you know I, I felt like I, I was sad to leave but it was a you know I was leaving for a good reason um but yeah that's kind of the work that they do it it's very much dependent upon the contracts that they're winning and um you know what department you're in but more or less like as a research analyst you're going to be writing and sometimes taking notes, which I did not like at all. And I felt like I did not get a master's to take notes, but you know, <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. And, and once again, I think it goes back to like advocating and asking for, for things to, as you said, you asked to be on the public health side and do that kind of work, which, which is definitely important because you never would have gotten it if you didn't. Um, and then, so after this role, you become a pediatric practice consultant at Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. So how do you come across this position? So I was, or am uh, in the Black Ladies in Public Health group on Facebook and social media, LinkedIn, um, Instagram. And I saw this posting for this role that was a pediatric practice consultant with Care First. I honestly never in my life thought that I would work for an insurer, right? Because in public health, you think that the insurance companies are the devil. Um, and in, I mean, in medicine, you kind of also think that insurance companies are the devil. They're like trying to take all your money. They don't want to pay you, like all these things, right? And so I, I saw the posting and as it was listed, it said, you know, here's this role that's in uh, the, at the time, the patient centered medical home program. This is going to be helping pediatric providers learn different population health strategies in order to not only beat their budget, um, but also to kind of improve their quality and the quality of care for their patients that our Care First members. And so I was like, well, this is interesting. I, I'll be honest, this was the first time that I was also thinking about um, applying for a DRPH. So I thought in my mind, here I am, someone who has had direct, like, uh, direct medical care and being a medical assistant. I now have the research side of things at NORC. And what am I missing that would make me like even more well-equipped to be a leader and to like have this doctorate in public health? And so I was like, well, duh, you need like the insurance side because no one really knows insurance. No one understands it. Um, and insurance is also that weird space that like there's a lot of advocacy that happens because it also is like lobbying. And so I was like, well, maybe it's not that bad, right? So I ended up contacting two people that had posted the um, job in the Black Ladies in Public Health group, and I asked them for their perspective. You know, they're in the group, so they're Black, and it helps. <laughs> I was like, what is care first? Is this a bad decision? 
be honest with me and like do y'all like it? Like, what's going on over there? And so they were both very honest. Uh, they were very open and answered a lot of my questions. They gave me the good and the bads of it. Uh, this was a brand new position. So Care First has had one of the longest standing and largest kind of patient-centered medical home programs. And they, for some reason, thought that peds and adults operate the same. And, you know, no, like, <laughs> peds are not just little, like, adults, adults they're, they're yeah. their own kind of, like, body of work. And so they were like, yeah, we need this peds PCMH program. We need to make it special for the pediatric population and the pediatricians that are operating in the patient-centered medical home program. And so I, I applied, I interviewed, I did all the things, and... I still, still had people kind of being like, are you sure you want to go to an insurer? Like, I don't know. I didn't have a great experience with that. And I'm very close with one of the pediatricians who used to work at Potomac Pediatrics. And she was kind of like, I don't think you should do it because I remember PCMH when they were in our office and, you know, it's not what you want to do. It's not going to be a good experience. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to kind of make moves and you have to do what feels right. And I felt like I needed to have that insurance side of things. I needed to understand what we were all kind of like reticent to be a part of and what we all were pushing against. Because I do think that sometimes you need to have the good people in the bad places in order to make change. Um, and so I was willing to be that person for a little bit. Let's see what happens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. And I'm glad that you used your network to find out like about the position and if you think it would be a good fit. And then to the point of insurance, insurance is highly, highly, highly complicated. Um, and <laughs> I, I could only imagine how much like you learned or like you, you didn't know that you now know right now, because I know a lot of doctors don't understand insurance, a lot of public health people don't understand insurance, like insurance is just highly, highly complicated. Um, so, so did you have a good experience there? Well, you, you're, still, still you're still working there. Leave. Yes. <laughs> yes. Ooh. So, ooh. so yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do not oh, know something that you email. know. I, yeah, I, I do not know anything. That, I, everything that you told me is <laughs> everything that I know. <laughs> okay, so so you are a consultant or a consultant. Would does that mean you were contracted or did you have a full time position? So it is consultant on the side of the providers. Okay, so I'm full time. Have always been full time with Care First. But what happens with the providers that are in the patient-centered medical home program is that you're essentially put into the situation where you're given a virtual bank account. And the idea is, is that if you follow kind of our population health strategies, if you are more aware of like specialist referrals and the cost of different hospitals and try to kind of divert some of the care back into the primary care office, that you should, in theory, be able to beat this budget because this budget is based off of your own patient population. It has adjustments for inflation. It has adjustments for the complexity of the patient population. And so if everything works out great, then you should have savings in your virtual bank account. Then those savings are shared back to you. And there's no cost to participate in the program, but the goal is, is that essentially, you know, through the program, we're able to divert costs and to reduce kind of the skyrocketing inflation of medicine and, or of the healthcare landscape. So in the adult space that has worked, they have been able to save, like, I think the number is now over $1 billion and so billion with a B. And, you know, over this like 10 year period, pediatrics is very different. It works very differently. It is largely preventative based, right? Like the, the, the hypothesis is, is that if you help these kids at young ages and kind of prevent some of the things that could happen if they go on for longer periods of time, that they become healthy adults, healthy adults cost the system less. But when you're building that into a system, it's kind of hard to really make that work. Pediatric budgets are very small. So that means it's less room for error in a budget. 
Um, and so that's where I was hired to come in to give some of that perspective and to help the pediatrician operate in what became a newly revamped kind of pediatric focused PCMH program, a lot more emphasis on quality, um, a lot more emphasis on, I came in heavily like, oh, we're not screening for social determinants of health. We're not even asking if y'all are screening for social determinants of health. We're going to do that now. Um, and so I, even before, you know, I knew that there would be the potential to get a, an additional kind of opportunity within Care First, I was like, well, I'm going to sprinkle some of me in here. And I know these providers are going to be mad about it because I've had quite a few conversations where providers told me that um, that's not an issue here. I, you know, my patients don't have food insecurity here. No, like we're in affluent, you know, Montgomery County, we're in affluent Fairfax, Virginia. That's not an issue here. Or they said, oh, I asked my Medicaid patients that, but I don't ask y'all commercial patients that because they, you know, they, they have care first. So why would they, why would they have any issues? Um, and so that was the start of me kind of like being like, okay, we're going to have some very real conversations <laughs> about how care first does not mean that you are rich and that you don't have these issues. And being rich doesn't mean that you don't have some of these issues. And um, just kind of starting that that process. So I realized I didn't really answer your question, but uh, as a consultant, essentially, it's like a free tool to help the providers do better in the PCMH program. They don't always want us in their office, but we're there and we are like, hired by care first to help them do better um so it's kind of like an inverse consultant relationship they don't they the practices don't hire but we go anyway <laughs> yeah as, as you should as you should because they i feel like there's a lot of cost savings that can be had in in the medical field uh that that is for sure that's for sure well thank you for sharing that even though it was a little off off the question i think it was very insightful in in, in everything that you said there and then uh, you you had your first promotion in this job to become a senior pediatric practice. Hold on, before I ask about that, before you're doing a lot of like informatics kind of work, did you use that skill set in this job? It seemed like you didn't, or it wasn't like a, a one of the primary skill sets you used. So oh, it actually, I actually do use it um, because the way that we are able to help the practices is through. Uh, this like reporting feature that we have that literally is just all data. Um, and so you have to learn how to manipulate the data. You have to know how to speak the data. You have to know if I'm then translating this to a practice, what are kind of the takeaways from this? And then because I still have that informatics and like EMR background, I take it a step further in my conversations with practices and I'm able to say, no, this is how you should be doing this. And this, this is what your EMR is capable of. Um, so I absolutely still use it. Probably not in like the way that my MPH uh, professor like would expect me to, but I'm using it in the way that I always perceived informatics to be. I think it's a proxy to improve health equity. It should not be kind of like everything that people are living in um, because you live in data so long that you don't really understand what that means in the real world. And so I think it's just one of the tools in my toolbox. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's cool to, to hear that like, uh, it came from being a medical assistant where you learn about these these health records and, and how you can really just use that. And how, how you, se you said it was like underutilized. And I think it still is underutilized to, to this day. Oh, so yeah. so there, there, there's a lot to say there. So you got a promotion to senior pediatric practice consultant. What was this change in role and what, what did it do for your responsibilities? So essentially, I was it's like a stepwise promotion at care first um and it just recognized that i was probably a little bit more knowledgeable about like the pcmh program than someone that had just started it honestly did not change my role that much um beyond the fact of like this is now recognized the the goal is is when you're a senior consultant that you take on more special projects but because I was already kind of helping design and lead our pediatrics program, it wasn't like, oh, now here's this new special project because essentially everything that I was doing was a special project. Um, but it did 
you know, it, it's it's nice to be recognized. It did come with like, you know, a little, little bit of money. Uh, so we accept all promotions over here. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair enough fair enough uh they, they never pay you enough you know they never pay you enough so you can always advocate for more pay <laughs> oh awesome and, and then you also got another promotion right into health equity enterprise manager which is your current role so t- tell me how how does one get two promotions within a pandemic like this <laughs> you start to cause some good trouble <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. So, all right, let's see where this started. Um, in you know, when everything was really starting to get underway with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and, um, you know, the, the numerous kind of just onslaught of Black trauma, our company came out and said that they were going to be actively anti-racist. Um, so, you know, that meant that our CEO said that if we're in a conversation and it feels uncomfortable, we can stop it at any point in time and kind of address the issues that are there. Um, and that is a huge underworking. It, it's not easy. Care First is not a small company, um, you know, over 5,000 people and a lot of people also that are very set in their ways and probably never thought that they would be working at a company that would have a banner on the website that literally says, we stand for justice and um, for Black lives. So um, within the pandemic, I think the one thing that really just started to hit home was that I grew up very pro-Black. There was never a, there was never a time when I was ashamed of being Black. I have never questioned, is it, you know, what did I do to become Black or anything like that? Like, it was like, no, like, this is where it's at. Black is beautiful. And, you know, everything else, is, it is what it is. <laughs> no shade. I, I love all people. But, um, you know, I think we're just special. And that was very much who my dad was. He was someone who, he was a police officer at the time, but he um, was at the March on Washington. He was very big on giving back to the community. He was born and raised in D.C., very much like a Washingtonian all about like black people in the community and I was like I I missed that piece of me and I think I had been silencing myself I had been advocating a little bit here and there and I had been trying to be a little bit more vocal about who I am here and there but at that point like in the height of the pandemic I was like you know what y'all are about to get all of this blackness and you're gonna like it or not and I I can't help it right because people are dying and I'm tired of it and we can't change anything if we're quiet so I, I started making trouble and when we were in June my vice president he asked me you know how are you doing and I was like do you want the honest answer? Like, I'm not doing well. Like, this is not a good time right now. And he's like, well, what can I do to help? And I'm an introvert. So I had to, I had to process. I was like, let me get back to you. I don't know. Like, I need to think through this. I, I know what I want to say, but I don't know if that's the right thing. So let's just, let's come back to this in a little bit. And so I thought it through and I emailed him and I said, Juneteenth is, right around the corner you know it'd be nice if we like celebrated this day that you know recognizes who black people are and the fact that we got some freedom because we're you know not really free yet and so he was like okay like we can get this what do you need what do you want what do you want to do and I said well I think I want to like show a blackish video and Um, you know, they have the episode about Juneteenth and then we can just like have an open discussion. It'll be fine. And it evolved. It became a larger thing where it was supposed to just be our department, which is about 30 to 40 people. And then it got sent out to our division and our division is the largest within care first. So I'm in the health service, health services division, which is, I want to say about 700 or so people. And it got sent out to them and to our larger division and I was like oh this is like y'all really want to do this y'all really want to talk about your team and talk about like being black okay um so I created a video that because 
long story short, like our Claire First internet is locked down. Like we cannot do a lot of things on it. And so that meant that getting this blackish episode was not easy. And so I was like, well, I can't do that. Like now I need to figure out something else. So essentially I started working on this like timeline that was saying here was Juneteenth. And then here are all the things that have happened since Juneteenth, all the way to George Floyd. This is why this is important and this conversation needs to be had. And this is why people are mad. And it became an event. Um, I, I want to say about 350 people attended online. And that kind of became the start of me being this like good troublemaker. And I think as I continue to make more and more trouble and make more videos and be more vocal, it became clear that like this little black girl is not going to be quiet. And if she keeps talking about health equity, we're going to have to do something that like really is like on board with it. And um, my VP, I will say he is, he's very receptive to me. Um, another thing about working and advocating for yourself is to not be afraid to like ask for what you need. And in July of this year, I went to him and I said, I need something else. I, I love my pediatric practices. I love working with those providers, but I need to align my current job with what I'm passionate about and what I have shown this company that is my skill set, and that is health equity. Um, I will continue working because I'm also like in the behind the scenes working on this like uh, larger uh, agreement with one of the clinically integrated networks and peds. Um, but I, I was like, I, I need health equity to be at the forefront. I need us to be honest that we are going to do this. And I think before there was never someone that was really designed and just dedicated to the health equity initiative. Care First is too large to not have someone that's like designed and meant to ensure that we're moving forward. So okay long okay. story sorry <laughs> yeah, no 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 definitely long story definitely worth it and i think that that there were a lot of insights in there that people can use to to maybe help them navigate their jobs or their boss as well i'm i'm glad your boss was receptive to all the things that you had to say and was and you were also open to sharing candidly what you were thinking and and all of that and asking for for something that aligns more with what what you're passionate about in the work that you're doing that is that's that's an awesome story i'm, I'm really glad uh, that you told it and that you shared it with us um, so, so what do you do specifically in, in this as a health equity enterprise manager? So I am responsible for shepherding and kind of getting our feet like on the ground with all of our health equity initiatives. So the larger Blue Cross Blue Shield Association has come out and said that within the next five years, there is a goal to reduce uh, maternal mortality by 50%. That, that's a large goal. And there are so many different departments and people working on different work streams within um, our company that it, it's easy for multiple people to be working on the same thing at the same time. And so in my role, it's essentially to kind of reduce some of that redundancy and to ensure that timeline wise, we're doing what we need to in order to reach that goal, as well as some of the others that we have, right? We have a new community health and social impact department that is led by an amazing VP, a black woman who I will say um, in June, when I started on this, like June, 2020, when I started on that Juneteenth project, I met her and I kind of like just latched onto her because here is a black woman, a VP, that is like doing all the things that like I see public health doing at this insurance company, right? Like it, that's possible. Um, and so I do a lot of work with her um, in looking at, you know, what are we doing with some of the larger kind of situation with the maternal health spaces? That means that we need to get more of an understanding of, are we embracing the quality aspect of things? Are we working more in the community? Are we um, starting to look at what does it mean to, to credential like community health workers and doulas and all of those things? So honestly, it's a lot of projects 
And I just am always a seat at the table to ensure that we're going in the right direction. And that that perspective, that health equity lens is always there because Care First is a white company. It is predominantly white space. And so there's all there's not always that health equity lens there. And especially within our programs that impact our provider community, our pediatric community, our member community. Um, and so it this this new position gives me that opportunity to kind of, you know, knock on the door and be like, did y'all think about this? Who who who's this impacting? I don't know if we should do that. And so, you know, I get to continue making good trouble. So <laughs> I like that you say good trouble. <laughs> that's, a, that's awesome. That's awesome. But yeah, that, that, that seems like it's really awesome work. And I'm I'm glad that you're able to do that. Um and then through through this role or through your job, you are a board member at Rebuilding Together DC Alexandria. So what is Rebuilding Together DC Alexandria, first of all? So Rebuilding Together DC Alexandria is a chapter of Rebuilding Together. So I think people are more familiar with Habitat for Humanity, um, but Rebuilding Together is essentially a similar company and nonprofit organization, but is just US-based. Um, and so work on um, homes, senior homes, work on uh, community spaces and environments to just ensure the safety and well-being of the people that live there. Um, and they originally were just in the Alexandria uh, space, but then um, in the past year, they uh, essentially combined the chapters of DC and Alexandria to be one. And so that meant that they needed to have representation that understands the DC area that also is more diverse. Um, and, you know, it's always great to get some young blood in there. And so they reached out to Care First and said, you know, do you have anyone that might be interested in being a part of our board? Th these are kind of the qualifications requirements. We really would love someone in the healthcare space because prior to that, prior to 2020, I, I don't think people really understood like social determinants of health and that housing definitely impacts health. And um, they needed to have someone that can understand that a little bit better and speak to that piece. And so it's been a great opportunity. Um, this I'm going now into my second year on the board. And I, I hope that, you know, there's a lot more good work that they're doing, especially in the DC area, especially for the seniors and, um, you know, generational homes. And I think one of the pieces that is really significant and special about rebuilding together is that when they make these repairs to the homes, it allows people to keep the homes longer, right? So um, a lot of the homes in DC due to gentrification and kind of due to the kind of falling apart nature that they're in, people leave their homes. And so you're leaving generational wealth, you're leaving security, you're leaving that like that space that entity that people can come back to and you know feel like this is what our this is grandma's home or this was mom's home or whoever and they're they're able to help preserve some of that that neighborhood um feel and that preservation of kind of the home and health aspect of things Okay, that, that makes sense. And that's cool that you're able to sit on the board as a board member. And yeah, it's definitely important to have you with your perspectives to, to sit on there and to guide that work. As you said, like social determinants of health is very new for a lot of people. And uh, is, is very important. And then to touch on a point that you made earlier, um, like you were saying that you, you, you weren't sure how you'd feel being in the insurance company and working in, in like this big system that has done 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 what is done um but but I, I i think from from what you're saying is like you need to be part of the system to make those changes or to at least because the system is going to be there regardless so the so to be there to to advocate for for the things that are important to you and really focusing on equity and how how that can be a part of of what the work that they're doing to really 
like broaden and leverage what you're doing into what they're doing. And hopefully that, that creates some sort of systemic change in how they are doing their work as well. So, so I think that that's just really important to also note there. And then, so after, well, not after, you're still in the stroll. Uh, so, so you started- You really uh, are trying to get me out of here. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I am not, I am not, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so you started your consulting business, uh, Health Equity Jazz. Well, when did you start this? So we're, we're getting the LLC very soon. Um, but I, I guess in the background, I started to start the idea of health equity jazz when um, Christy reached out to me actually and wanted to use uh, one of my videos in her course. And I was like, what? Like, you want to put one of my videos in a course? I, why? Like, I mean, you know, um, imposter syndrome is real. So if you know what I'm talking about, like it, it can really cause you to not understand how magical and how amazing you are. And so I was like, I mean, I, I guess, sure. Um, and so when she asked that, I was like, well, is there a space for me to do more of this, to create more videos, to have someone pay for these videos? Because if you're in content creation, it's not cheap. Um, especially when you're like teaching yourself Adobe and all of those things, like that's not cheap. And I was like, I mean, I guess. And at the time I was also like, well, I do have a lot of experience in this. And I, I think that I can bring a different lens to things. I can talk about different perspectives. I've, I've worked in all the different kind of areas now and I am passionate about it. So, you know, why not? And I think in the back of my mind, though, that that meme that was out that was like, if you've gone through the whole pandemic and haven't started a second job, like you're doing it wrong. Although I will say, I think that that is highly problematic to push on people. Don't do that. Like, it is a lot of work. And also, I am very much about getting your rest. Um, I think this pandemic is a good time to rest. Um, but I, I was like, well, you know, let me start this. Let me, let me play around with this. Uh, and then I think the big push was when I, I Googled and I was like, does healthequityjazz.com exist? Is anyone else using this name? And no one was. And so I was like, uh, maybe. And then um, my partner, actually, he bought my domain. And I was like, well, I guess I got to do it now. So <laughs> that's how we got here. Okay, that, that's awesome. And, and I'm glad that, that you said that it's not an LLC as yet and that um, you, you started off by, by just making content and then Christy reached out to you and then you're like, oh, is this actually a thing that I can create a business around? And then you, you had that thought process because I feel like a lot of people sometimes just want to create a business to create a business and there might be any need around it. So, so you really thinking through that, I, I think it's just, it's just very important and, and that's awesome. And um, t t tell me why, why do you want the LLC um, compared to like a sole proprietorship? So I was thinking through the process and honestly, I was going to like, just let it go and let it be its own thing. Um, but I started to get other kind of contracts and other people that were interested in working with me. And I was like, I should probably finalize this and like actually make it like a thing and like get it registered and you know it would be nice to like at some point trademark myself why not you know um but yeah I honestly I used to have another the things that we do I used to have another company um I used to tutor very heavily and actually was very successful at it um but it was also kind of a um like I need this to survive type thing um so it just, it felt like I should just go ahead and like follow the same path that I did with that company, which was also an LLC. Um, so that was kind of the thought process. I really also just needed to make things more official so that I could get these larger contracts and, um, you know, let Health Equity Jazz be its own like income stream. Okay, that, that's dope. Um, I'm glad to hear that. So what, what kind of services do you offer right now? So I am always available to consult. Um, so 
there are, you know, people that are tapping into work on different projects and to get my perspective on how do we have these difficult conversations and how do we ensure that we're keeping health equity at the forefront, even in spaces that aren't necessarily considered health equity, right? Because I think they're the applications and kind of the tools that you have in being able to apply a health equity lens are applicable across the board in education and science and in business. It, all of it applies, all of it works. And so um, the consulting services as well as video creation. So I have always been a creative and I think I lost it along the way and now I'm leaning back into it. So I uh, enjoy kind of creating videos that are on different topics. Right now they're mostly just, they end up being offshoots of things that people ask for at Care First. And then I'm like, are y'all really sure y'all want me to do this? And they're like, yeah, we want you to talk about X. And I'm like, and what are my parameters? And are you sure that I can say whatever I want to say? And they're like, yeah, we just want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you asked for it. Um, so that's the other piece of it. Uh, you know, I'm sure as I evolve in the space, there might be things that pop up and I'm like, oh, I could do that too. Um, but I also feel like it's better to start small. So I'm saying consulting and video creation. And then, you know, as we grow in this, we'll see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, th I think like don't, don't chase too many things. Uh, people, I feel like people chase too many things and then things just get crazy. And then you, you're like burnt out and you're doing all these different things and you're not really figuring out what you're best at and, and all of that, all that good stuff. So, so that's awesome. And video creation for, for like, that, that's awesome in itself um i, I think that it it is needed especially in, in the health equity space i feel like not enough people know about how to center that and i'm glad that you are taking it upon yourself to 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 do that kind of work and really really uh do that yeah so i don't know what i was gonna say there but yeah <laughs> that, that that's really <laughs> awesome um but no, that's, that's what i was gonna ask i was gonna ask because before the interview during the interview you said that you're an introvert but you're an introvert that's making these videos. How how did you, how are you able to to overcome that? If if I'm if that's the right team to, to to say. Yeah, so I, I definitely am an introvert. I'm not even an ambivert. Like I I do not. I can exist in extroverted spaces because I think when you are in a minority group, you just learn how to like exist anyway. Um, and so I. I can do it. I don't excel in it. I don't necessarily like it, um, but I'll do it. I think the biggest thing has been being honest about who I am and probably, you know, also in that space of like advocating, I like to say and make it known that I'm an introvert so that you don't expect me to like be sitting here rambling off all these thoughts that I have not thought about beforehand, right? So I really appreciated that you sent questions before <laughs> so that it allowed me to think through my process and what I would say. And, you know, yes, I'm kind of off the cuff now because I, you know, we've been talking for a while, but like it at least allowed me to center myself and to honor the space that I needed to be in. Um, and so with the video creation, while I'm in an I'm an introvert. I've always been vulnerable with people. I've always been willing to kind of share my story and to share my perspective. And then I go home and kind of like crash from that. So like during Juneteenth, I was doing a lot like Juneteenth this year, I was presenting at Care First. And then I did like a talk with the NAACP chapter in Randallstown, as well as kind of putting on my own social media, different things about Juneteenth and different perspectives. And after that, like I literally slept for probably like 18 hours. Like I was exhausted. My body was like, we're done. You've done too much. You've exerted all of the like battery that you have for these extroverted activities. And I just honor that space. So like, I, I very much know when I need to take a break and I, I just allow myself to, you know, say like, hey, you're not gonna get that today. Um, my battery is done and, you know, it'll, it'll replenish and we'll be okay. 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 That's awesome. And, and 
I'm glad that you're, you're, you're taking the steps to be a little un uncomfortable and draining your energy sometimes, hopefully not too much, a lot of the times to, to put out and do the work that you're doing because it, it is uh, greatly important. Where, where can people um, connect with, with Health Equity Jazz? So you can go to my website, healthequityjazz.com. You can follow me on Instagram, Health Equity Jazz. You can follow me on Twitter, Health Equity Pro. So, you know, Twitter is annoying. Um, and then <laughs> if you want to invest in Health Equity Jazz and um, also get an unfiltered view of me monthly and what I'm thinking about, what I'm doing, kind of get a behind the scenes look. I also have a Patreon um, and that is Health Equity Jazz. And you can follow me on LinkedIn as well. Um, that is also Health Equity Jazz. Okay, awesome. And I'll, I'll so be all health equity jazz except for Twitter because <laughs> I'm one two letter too long. So annoying. There's a cap on, on the letters for, for your handle on Twitter? Yes. Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> uh interesting too but i will i will link to all of those in the show notes if anybody wants to check it out or support jazz and health equity jazz um so, so thank you for that and then i know um earlier on you you said or you spoke about or you touched on thinking about doing your drph doctor of public health and i know that you are thinking about that now so, so just i'm giving you the floor to share more about that thought process Yes. So I, I think I said that I had initially thought about it back when I was deciding to go to care first. I, I learned about the DRPH programs then um, because the thing about when you're at NORC, a lot of people have doctorates and I, you know, kind of get like education envy. I think of myself as a forever student. And so it's kind of like, I was like, I want a degree too, like, you know, um, but then also speaking to, you know, little Jasmine who always wanted to be a doctor and she just didn't have the right words to know that like it was going to be a doctorate in public health versus a medical doctor. Um, so now with everything kind of happening, with these promotions, having the ability to really be who I am authentically in the professional space. Um, you know, even dreading my hair, um, just feeling like I'm living my best life. I was like, why not go to school again? Um, why not get this terminal degree? Because I think I'm done after this. I, I think I am. People say that I'm probably going to go back for something else. I, I want to say I'm done. Um, yeah, I, I want to be done after this one. Uh, my, <laughs> we can check in a few years later to see if I'm done. Um, but yeah the the doctorate in public health was still speaking to me i did look at phd programs um but one thing i'm not trying to be a broke student again and you know these phd programs want you to be full time they want you to be in person they want all of these things and i'm like guys i i can't do that life i i've done it i don't recommend it and I just don't want to do like, that's not me. Um, so DRPH programs are great. They, you know, most, well, I won't say most, because there's still some outdated DRPH programs that want you to be in person as well, i.e. Harvard and Columbia, get yourselves together. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I am applying. SOFIS opened up today. So what is this? This is uh, August 18th, opened up today. And yeah, I, I'm starting the daunting process of writing a statement of purpose and applying to three or four programs and, you know, God willing, come summer of next year, I'll be back in school. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. And is there, is there any specific focus that you're, you're going towards in your DRPH? health equity <laughs> <laughs> i shouldn't even ask right <laughs> i mean i can't do anything else at this point um so you know even if it's not written into the program it's going to be a health equity focus somehow um and so that is very much where i'm at there are a couple of programs that specifically allow like concentrations and health equity so i am looking at those but then one thing about me um and I, I didn't really touch on this at um, when I was talking about Brown, but I've always been a person that is willing to demand what I want. 
and to kind of buck the system, right? So I did a double concentration at Brown and my first advisor told me, I don't recommend that because people do really well in one and then poorly in another. And I was like, well, that's not me. Like, no, there is a perfect intersection between human biology and Africana studies. So no, um, I ended up canceling her as an advisor. And then I got my, uh, my advisor, Lundy Braun, who was amazing because she realized that yes, these two things do intersect. And I was a very insightful 18 year old, maybe 19 at the time to want to do the two. So um, the same will be for this DRPH. Even if y'all don't explicitly have it out there, I'm going to find a way to bring it in. So that's what we're doing. That's, that is awesome. That is awesome. And I uh, definitely think you will find your way to do that. And like one other insight you just shared there, like even if your faculty advisor doesn't see the value in what you're doing or telling you that it's not going to be beneficial, it's going to be hard one way or the other, sometimes you got to fire your faculty advisor and get another one, as, as you just said. So, so that, that's awesome. Awesome that you share that as well. Um, so before we move on to the Furious Five, the five questions I ask all guests, I wanted to ask you, where would you like to see yourself in the future besides your DRPH, I guess? Yeah, so in the future, I'm going to be Dr. Health Equity Jazz. Um, already looking at, are those handles available? <laughs> Not really. Um, but I want to be a mom. And however that happens, um, it is, you know, it's something that I really ran from um, as a 20-year-old me in late 20s. Um, because of the trauma of like losing my mom, I was like, I don't want to have kids. I don't want to die young. I don't want to do any of that. So it's not happening. But um, when I allowed myself to heal, I it was very apparent and clear that that is something that I want to do, however it happens. Um, and so I, I see myself being a mom, great raising beautiful Black children and teaching them all the things that my parents taught me about being proud of who you are and building the community, giving back to the community, loving the community. And of course, I'm gonna still be getting in trouble. Um, so, you know, it would be nice to be like paid to get in trouble a little bit more to like be a correspondent and get to talk to people about all the things. Um, so we'll see. Okay, awesome. Well, well, I look forward to seeing everything unfold from DRPH to becoming a mom and everything else with Health Equity Jazz and, and how that all goes for you. So we'll definitely stay in contact. That I guess that's a given um, for sure. <laughs> uh, so moving on to the last section of the show, the Furious Five. Um, number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Be yourself authentically you and the earlier you learn to do that the better because there are going to be numerous times where you feel like did I make the right decision is this the right path for me and the more that you lean into who you are the more the universe will just align itself to show you that you're on the right path these are the right people that should guide you and you know at the end of it everything's gonna be okay it life is a journey but when you stick to who you are, I think everything ends up okay. Great advice. Number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? And I guess as a, both as a, a health equity manager and then also with your consulting business, Health Equity Jazz. So in terms of professions and I'll say like corporate jobs, I think you have to learn how to advocate for yourself and then to do the things that you may not want to do. I think one of the things that people that are in the majority communities and even for men, it's a lot easier to kind of network outside of work. You know, you go to the bars, you have conversations over sports and things like that. And it's almost like this unspoken community that happens. And that's what allows a lot of people to get above and ahead. Um, and so you have to learn how to break that system and get into it. So I will text, you know, my uh, VP and say, hey, like, can we go for coffee? Can we go to have drinks? Can we just talk? And when you get people outside of the workplace, that's where the magic happens. Honestly, I, I, 
I stand by that. I think that, you know, that's how these like old, like the old white clubs and old men's clubs, like that's how those work. And we still essentially have to work within that system and, you know, make the system work for you. And if you are looking to start your own business, I think find the thing that you're passionate about and then survey the, the landscape to see if what you're doing makes sense. If you don't like it, starting your own business is gonna be like the worst thing in the world because it's not easy. It's literally you doing like something in addition to hopefully what you're like employed to do. Um, so my other thing about that is to let your current job be your investor <laughs> in your company. Um, so Care First is actively investing in health equity jazz, whether they know it or not. And I, I think they know, um, but yeah, like make sure you're passionate about it. And then please don't quit your full-time job until you are stable and maybe don't even do that at all. But like, I don't know. It depends on what, what you're trying to do financially. Fair enough. Fair enough. Great advice. Um, number three, what's something you're working on improving in your life right now? I'm working on showing up for myself. So the one thing about being an introvert, I'm also an empath and I take in a lot of people's energies and then that causes me to like want to be available all the time because I feel like, well, if you are reaching out to me, you need me. And then that means that my introvert battery is super, super low and then I'm crabby and I'm irrational and I don't want to do things. And it's, all because I did it to myself. Um, and I think the pandemic has kind of, for the good and the bad again, like it's kind of highlighted the importance of self-care, but then it also has made it easier for you to overextend yourself. So I'm really trying to be better about doing the self-care activities that mean a lot to me. And also the things that I would never have done before in terms of like dreading my hair, something that I'd always wanted to do but I was like no it costs too much money I don't I shouldn't spend money on that blah 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 now I'm like we're gonna spend the money on me it's gonna be okay the world and the universe will bring it back to me and this is what I want absolutely absolutely and I love the hair by the way I love the hair thank you you're most welcome <laughs> number four professionally do you recommend anything oh yes I recommend stepping away from the seriousness of life and watching trash television. <laughs> I, I cannot tell you how much trash television I watch. And people are like, you're so smart. How do you watch this? And I'm like, because the world sucks. And sometimes you just need to like escape. And if you're serious all the time, and if you're reading all of the like heavy, dense work all the time, it, it will literally drain you. And so I watch reality television. I, I admit it. Please don't lose respect for me, y'all. Please keep following me. I don't talk about it on health equity jazz. Okay. So like, if you feel like it's going to become a social media commentary on reality television, I don't do that um but yeah it's my vice sorry <laughs> fair, fair enough you, so, you sound exactly like my sister right now I'm like how, how do you watch this and she's like you know it's just entertainment you know just gets your mind away from it it's just stupid stupidness that people watch I don't know I, I, not, not for me but <laughs> if it works for you it works for you right and then um last but not least where can people connect with you yes so you can find me on my website, healthequityjazz.com. I do blog on there. So if you want to read some of the things that I'm thinking about, or um, I'm trying to be very pointed in the things that I talk about on there. So, you know, it's not in all access to Jasmine, but it's definitely a personal side to me. I am on Instagram, Health Equity Jazz. I am on Twitter, Health Equity Pro, P-R-O. And I am on LinkedIn, um, whatever, linkedin.com slash IN, health equity jazz, also Jasmine Leonard, MPH there. And you can also, if you want to invest in me on Patreon, um, patreon.com slash health equity jazz. 
And on Patreon, you get full access to full length videos that I create. You get mentioned in my videos and my acknowledgement, sec acknowledgement section. You also get an unfiltered monthly update from me. And it, it's pretty lit. I'm not going to lie. Like I, I, I spent a, quite a bit of time talking about the Olympics and the trash with Simone Biles and all of that. So, you know, if you want to get the nitty gritty side of Jasmine, that's there as well as I'm gonna start doing lives on Patreon. So you can ask me all the questions and see kind of how I create videos and things like that. Yeah, that's awesome, that's awesome. And definitely tap in with, with Jasmine on any or all of those platforms. And I'll definitely be sure to link all of that in the uh, show notes and maybe in the description of the show. I'm not probably just in the show notes. I, I don't know, I'm trying to create too much hope for myself, of course. Eh? <laughs> anyway, th thank you so much for coming on, Jasmine, and sharing your story. I really appreciated the insights that you shared and and all, all of your journey. It has been very uh, inspirational and I'm, I'm glad that you're doing the work that you're doing. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Clearly, Jace is also saying thanks for having us. Um, I don't know if you can hear him barking again. But yeah, I'm I'm very happy to have been here and to share insights. And hopefully someone finds what I say helpful. <laughs> it definitely will. Definitely will. And so just housekeeping items uh, before we head out here today. Thanks for watching, everyone. Or thanks for listening. If you're listening to this, greatly, greatly appreciate it. Be sure that you subscribe. Be sure that you like this video. You review it. You share it with a friend. And uh, if you want to support, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash the PH Millennial and uh, support there. Uh, thank you all and see you all next week.